Why would people wear helmets that only protect part of the face or leave it completely exposed? Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatory. Now, a few things have come up in recent videos and also comments underneath uh, pictures that I've put up on the Facebook page and other social media and indeed videos that I've put on my channel where people have questioned why would someone who's preparing to go into combat have a type of helmet which only protects part of their face and leaves part of it exposed, for example, the mouth, the jaw, the nose, or indeed have a totally open face helmet at all. Why would soldiers or any type of uh, combat personnel wear helmets like this? Now, obviously this question does in fact apply to a lot of fictional characters, superheroes, for example, uh, Batman, Captain Marvel, Captain America, um, Judge Dredd, Juggernaut, all sorts of examples we've got from the comic book and movie world. And uh, often this is um, railed at them as a criticism. It's like, well, why would you wear a helmet which leaves part of the face exposed? That's really stupid. But then, of course, we've got real life. We've got real modern day examples and we've got history to look at. So what we're going to look at in this video is firstly, why would you have the face open and exposed or at least part of the face exposed? And secondly, we're going to look at some historical examples and maybe drill down into why they did that in that particular time and place. But before I go on, we're going to have a quick word from our wonderful sponsors for this video who are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a hugely popular fantasy turn-based combat game. So I've always been a huge fan of elves, every kind of elves, wood elves, high elves, moon elves, big elves, small elves, all the elves you can think of. But here we're going to be specifically looking at the evil dark elves. In Teleria we've basically got two types of elves. They used to be one type, but Siroth tempted some of them away and they became the dark elves. Amazingly, he actually tempted them with art and philosophy. The Arbiter tried to lure some of these elves back to the light side, but it didn't really work and in fact they kind of doubled down and became even more evil. And inevitably a war broke out between the High Elves and the Dark Elves and it's never really stopped 700 years later, it's still going on. And honestly when you prefer the High Elves and the Dark Elves, you've got to admit the Dark Elves are pretty damn awesome. They look really cool and they've got some awesome assassins and special abilities unique to them. The dark Elf designs look pretty damn amazing. Here are some of my favourite ones. One of them's got to be Foley because of his absolutely awesome armour. And at first sight, you might not even realise it's Dark Elf, uh, but he's a fully armoured Dark Elf with very, very unique design to that armour. Another one of my favourites is Vizia Avelis. I hope I'm saying that name right, but he's got absolutely awesome armour. And again, it's actually been thought out quite practically, so it looks very different to historical armour, but it looks kind of plausible, and I love those two kind of Valshan Nessa type weapons that he wields. What I personally love the most about Raid is fighting in the arena and putting together my team, upgrading my team and using them tactically. So there's a ton of new stuff happening in Raid this month. Special events every day, a bunch of awesome new champions and a brand new Guardian Ring that gives you a load of new ways to use your champions. And at the start of December, Raid's releasing one of its biggest, most anticipated features ever. Take a look at this. It looks absolutely insane with all these new updates and an even bigger one right around the corner. Now's the perfect time to get started in Raid. If you wait any longer, you are only going to get behind. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, then all you have to do is hit that link in the description below or scan the QR code on my screen and you'll get an epic hero called Chonaru who's amazing in the Doom Tower. 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard. So you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get into the game. You can find all these rewards up here in the inbox and remember that this offer is only available to new players and only for the next 30 days. If you're quick enough, you can maybe join my clan and you can find me in game under the name Captain Context. So go and check out that link now and I'll see you in game. So thanks very much for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the main topic of this video, which is firstly, why would people have in the past or in the current day where types of helmet which only uh, protect a certain part of the face or indeed which leave the face fully exposed. We're going to look at modern and historical examples and drill down a little bit into why those particular people do that. And of course any of these explanations whether they're from the modern world or whether they're from history you could possibly extrapolate that for your stories if you're a writer or indeed if you're just trying to uh, understand some of the world building logic behind certain super heroes or uh, fantasy stories or whatever, anything like this. So you can apply these real world answers to the fantasy world um, if it so takes your fancy. So first up we're going to look at four main reasons why you might want to have a helmet that leaves the lower half 
or perhaps all of your face exposed. And the most important those I'm going to uh, most important reason of those which I'm going to hit first, uh, just in case you don't watch this whole video, is breathing. Okay, and you cannot overstate how important breathing is. And as soon as you start uh, doing anything, whether it's um, marching or whether it's fighting or whether it's digging um, entrenchments or trying to scale a ladder, any of these types of jobs that you might have to do as a soldier, being able to breathe freely is hugely important. Now, some of you hopefully will have seen recently that I did a um, some fighting in armor that was uh, actually put on Todd's channel. And um, in this, you know, I wear a salad and a bever. Now, a lot of people think of a salad and a bever as a fairly good compromise. It's relatively light, uh, relatively flexible and mobile. You can uh, remove the bever if you want to, to get more air or do various other things. And indeed, you can open the two things up. You can open up the visor on my particular salad um, and you can uh, breathe more or see more freely, okay? But the, the simple fact is when you're fighting in armor or doing any kind of fighting, you need a transfer of air into your lungs. And as soon as you start exerting yourself, and it's not just fighting, you could apply this to any physical activity. As soon as you start doing something, you need air. Now, a lot of people look at uh, full face helmets and think, wow, what a fantastic protection. But I will tell you uh, that it's very easy once you start fighting to start running out of air. And I think pretty much anyone who ever fights in full helmets and even to a small degree, fencing mask, it certainly kind of slightly slows down the, uh, the transfer of air. Of course, that's made of a mesh, so it's full of holes. And many helmets, many uh, visors or full sort of face helmets, whilst they might have breathing holes in them, a lot of them actually don't. And if they do, they're only on one side, uh, usually the right hand side actually. The left hand side is usually left stronger to receive lance strikes or anything like that. So the simple fact is that any type of full face helmet, be it a great helm or an armet or a close helmet or a bassinet um, with a visor, it will impede your breathing and you will notice it. And as soon as you start fighting in that type of helmet, once you've stopped fighting, one of the first things you wanna do is get your visor up or pull the helmet off, whichever is applicable to that particular helmet, to get air. Now the next hugely important reason to have an open face, um, or a partially covered face at least, might be relating to sight. Now this varies a little bit with um, different types of helmets, because obviously if you've got something like a salad with a, without a razable visor, um, so with a, uh, fixed, uh, with a fixed frontal plate, and you can't put the visor up, then clearly in, in uh, that situation, although you can tilt it back on the head and look under like that, um, when you've got the visor down, clearly you um, don't have that sight advantage. But generally speaking, anything which has an open face gives you a sight advantage. And even if like the salad, the uh, helmet only comes down to the middle of your face, you can see out of the bottom down here, especially when you're not wearing the accompanying beva in that situation. But with an open-faced helmet like this, I can basically see everything that I could see without a helmet on, okay? So there is no loss of sight whatsoever. And as I've spoken about in previous videos, sometimes sight is one of your best defenses. When you have a fully covered face, one of the disadvantages is your lack of peripheral vision, your lack of vision below about this height. Um, so generally a lack of awareness, and especially these types of helmets are usually accompanied with, some, with elements that cover the ears to some extent as well. So you've now got reduced sight, you've now got reduced hearing. So indeed, someone can steamroller you from that direction and you might not see them coming until it's too late. Whereas wearing this helmet, I've got the same peripheral vision that I do when I'm not wearing a helmet at all. So definitely after breathing, I think the next most important reason is vision. Now the third reason to have an open face helmet or at least part of your face um, exposed is what I will loosely term as comms, communications, okay? Now, clearly that could be speaking, communicating with the other soldiers that you're fighting alongside or 
police or whatever they might be, or indeed giving orders to your troops. These are super important things. So them being able to hear you, whether it's just a, an equal or whether it's an, uh, someone below you, or in some cases someone who's a higher rank than you, being able to communicate with them is a majorly important thing. And the simple fact is when you wear a full face um, covering, you can't communicate with speech very easily at all. In the recent filming with Todd, uh, we actually started out when I was wearing full harness with a beva and a salad, and they were both opened, and we had to fix the microphone right to the actual beva itself. You couldn't really hear me properly. As soon as I took the beva off, it was like I wasn't wearing any armour at all. So communications, as you know, in a broader, thinking outside of the one-on-one -on -one combat, when you think about battlefield or skirmish melee type situations, being able to communicate with people is super important. Also, I would say, if you're in any kind of law enforcement or policing role, and this might apply to people like Judge Dredd or Batman, then indeed, having your mouth able to be heard uh, and, and even seen is really, really important, actually, if you're going to be giving people orders with which you expect them to comply. We now think about Robocop. Now, I actually mentioned recently uh, in a video about Robocop, uh, like, why don't people just shoot him in the jaw? And people came back with that saying, well, oh, well, because his skeleton's made of some kind of metal. So, okay, fine. But then you think, okay, well, why did they design Robocop like that with an exposed mouth? It is because he's in a policing role. So it's very important for his mouth to be seen and to be able to be heard. Now, the fourth, and I would accept the less important and the more minor of these points, is eating and drinking. And of those, clearly drinking is more important than eating in a combat scenario. Clearly, if you're not in combat, you just take your helmet off. But drinking, especially if you're campaigning in summer and you might be engaged in some type of long engagement, for example, a siege or indeed just a, a battle that lasts all day and you're standing in line for a long time, being able to drink is a major important, uh, majorly important factor. And we know from medieval art, they show water carriers going around with jugs and stuff like this. They had to keep people de um, hydrated or they'd become dehydrated and might not be very effective at fighting anymore. Um, so being able to drink and eat, super important. And also as a sort of additional appendix point, I want to mention the over, over kind of overriding context to open face helmets, that it might simply be related to the amount of material or technology available in that period. The simple fact is that most cultures that have invented helmets have invented something that's a bit like this in various materials, something that protects the top of the head, because most missiles are going to be coming downwards, most blows are going to be coming downwards. If you're using a shield of some kind, uh, then most attacks are going to be coming downwards here, and the shield will protect to some degree the front of your face. Um, so this protects the most vulnerable part of your head, and if you only have a certain amount of iron or bronze or whatever you're making your helmets out of, then clearly this is the part you're going to protect first. If you have additional resources, then indeed you might start to add a nasal, or you might, if you're the Roman army, start to add other bits like cheek pieces here and a flap at the back. But notice it's still got an open face at the front for all of the reasons that I've mentioned previously. That is breathing, sight, communications, and to a lesser degree, perhaps eating and drinking. So now let's look at some of those historical examples as promised. And clearly, if we go back into the um, earliest periods of history for which we have art, the earliest helmets that we really know about protect the top of the head um, as mentioned. So the very first thing that you want to do is protect the top of the head primarily from blows and missiles. So things being thrown or shot at you and coming downwards and of course from blows or spear thrusts um, over the top of a shield. And bear in mind that shields have almost certainly been around a lot longer than helmets. So when we talk about the development of helmets, we can't, um, we can't divorce them from the development of shields. You have to think about what the shield is doing, what the shield is covering, and then the helmet is there to fill in the gap of the thing that's exposed over the top of the shield. In the ancient world, we have numerous examples of helmets which fundamentally protect the top of the head. And one of the first augmentations or additions that we see to this is in fact the cheek piece. And we see cheek pieces, uh, certainly obviously they appear fairly on in um, uh, Celtic or Gallic helmets and thereafter copied by the Romans. 
Of course, we've essentially got cheap pieces on the older uh, versions of um, types of Greek helmets. We have Greek helmets that have cheap pieces. And then, of course, you've got the famous hoplite helmet, which does have a small opening in the front for the eyes and mouth. And this is a compromise. Now, the, uh, if we call it the, the hoplite type helmet, I won't get into the typology of those helmets in this video, um, but that is pretty much one of the earliest full almost full face protection helmets that we have in history. But even then, the eyes have got a fairly large opening and the mouth and nose have an opening. So you've still got your breathing and you've still got a pretty good degree of um, vision, of sight as well. And those helmets sit very close to the head, unlike later medieval helmets, which sit further away from the head. So by having a small opening around the eye, you still have pretty good peripheral vision. It does cut into it slightly. When we get into the Roman era, of course, we still have an open face helmet with cheek pieces. And these cheek pieces offer brilliant protection to the sides of the face, uh, but they do leave the front of the face open. Uh, why? Well, for all of the aforementioned reasons. Uh, communications in the Roman army being especially important, but of course, sight and breathing and potentially drinking as well. But notice, as mentioned previously, in my uh, dedicated video talking about Roman helmets, the Romans actually left a space here for ears, once again showing that communications were extremely important to the Roman army. And we do see this on um, certain Greek helmets as well. So being able to hear commands, signals given, very, very, very important. Okay, so they can see, they can breathe, they can hear. And really the cheek pieces are a minimal concession to giving the face a bit more protection whilst not cutting into those vital senses. Now as we move forward in history and we enter the migration period, we actually see helmets which to some degree obviously owe some of their design origin not only to the Romans but also to um, various groups of people uh, to the east um, but essentially they've got helmet bowl usually well, very often something down the back and cheek pieces but an interesting thing happens and that is that helmets seem to as we go towards the year 1000 AD they start to become more like this but that is for a very good reason and that is because the sides and back of the head start to be protected by mail aka chainmail, which is attached to the male hauberk. So the male comes right the way around the head and around the neck, and so what the helmet's really doing is the helmet's going onto the top on there to protect you from the most um, serious blows and stabs and, and missiles coming downwards. But the sides of the head all the way around here are protected by mail. So don't think, although these were sometimes worn by themselves without mail, don't think that this is the only head protection. You've got to remember the mail, or chain mail, coming all the way around the back and sides of the head here. And some earlier types of helmets in the Viking period actually had a mail skirt added around the sides and back, so achieving the same thing. But the point for the purposes of this video I want you to take away is, despite all of that mail and all of that iron um, plate, they still had an open face. Yes, there's a nasal here to protect uh, from blows just cracking across the nose or hitting in the eyes or things sliding downwards, uh, not coming inwards so much. They're more likely to slide down and off. Uh, but the simple fact is that this type of helmet was still extremely popular right the way into the 13th century. Um, if you look at the uh, Morgan Bible, for example, still see loads and loads of these, despite the fact by that point that the Great Helm had been a thing for uh, about 80 years. The Great Helm had been an option. They did have full face helmets, but they still wore these in a lot of circumstances. So the simple fact is that these types of nasal helmets, as they're often called, were still seen as completely practical for knights and all sorts of soldiers, and in many cases preferable to full face covering helmets. Now if we fast forward into the 14th century, by the 14th century we've got great helms of various types, much more developed, they've been around for uh, over a century, century and a half, and uh, we've also got the bassinet which has come along and in some cases started to replace the great helm and very often has a visor of various sorts. Now the most famous type of snouty nosed uh, Hanskarl pig faced visor actually comes around really more around the year 1400s to the beginning of the 15th century. 
And these are fully protected faces. But if you look at great helms and if you look at bassinets, often they have raisable visors. So they are conceding now that you want the option. Sometimes you want to protect the face. Sometimes you want an open face. So you've got that concession there. But in addition to that, Huge numbers of soldiers were still wearing open face helmets. And there's a lot of evidence for people fighting in full harness with a bassinet, with an avantel. They're completely covered in plate, plate gauntlets, plate sabatons on their feet, plate from head to foot. And lo and behold, they still have an opening for the face. And keeping it concise, if we fast forward further into the 15th and 16th centuries, still we see types of helmet uh, types of uh, iron hat, types of salad, which still have open faces on them. So even at a time when any soldier who could have a helmet could have one of these that would, with a bever, protect the whole face, or indeed other types of helmet like armet and uh, later on close helmets, um, and indeed, you know, great helms, certainly at the beginning of the 15th century, were an option. But huge numbers of soldiers, both fully armoured knights and lower um, sort of rank soldiers, such as archers or typical foot soldiers, spearmen, pikemen, billmen, gunners, things like this, elected to have open face helmets because they saw them as more practical, better for breathing, better for seeing, some cases better for hearing, uh, communications, um, and just doing your job. If your job is to operate a bow, for example, then clearly you can shoot a bow with full face protection on, and it's shown in lots of art, but the simple fact is it's easier to do with an open face helmet. But even people who didn't necessarily need to do that, like crossbowmen or uh, gunners or various, you know, billmen and stuff like this, they often elected to have open face helmets as well at a time when facial protection was abundantly available if they had wanted it. Now, just very briefly, I want to mention the modern world outside of the, uh, outside of the ancient and medieval world battles and that is the use of helmets in the model world, modern world where they're still used by people like the military, the police, SWAT teams, um, firearms response, in some cases riot police. Now riot police are an interesting example that I'll come back to. Now in almost all cases of those what we see whether it's the military or the police or anything any similar kind of organization is we see helmets which fundamentally protect the top of the head and a little bit the back and a little bit the sides, but they have fully exposed faces. Why? For the exact reasons that I have said for medieval or ancient world warriors, so that they can see more easily, so they can speak and breathe more easily, eat more easily if needs be, donuts, no, no jokes there. But all of those reasons, it's still advantageous to have an open face, even in a military context where you're having bullets shot at you, shrapnel flying through the air, it is still preferable to have an open face with a modern bulletproof helmet. Just let that sink in. Next time you're criticizing a superhero having a bit of an exposed face, the modern military does exactly the same thing and the modern police does exactly the same thing. Now I did promise I'd just mention riot police. They're a little bit of a different situation in that they tend to have, certainly in the UK, they have visors. But those visors in that situation tend to be uh, perspex or some other type of ballistic um, plastic that you can fully see through. So it might possibly, I don't think it really, because it's far away from the face, I don't think it would really impede with, uh, with breathing. Uh, and of course, you can still see just as well in this kind of stuff. So because new materials have come along, uh, there are, you know, there are some options where, some situations where you might want to have some type of face covering, but th that's fully clear and you can see through. What I would say is as far as I know, that's never really done in the military, except in riot control. Um, and I think the reasons for that is probably to do with breathing and communication, because at the end of the day, it will still limit the ability you can um, hear and speak to your, to your um, uh, fellows. And also, potentially, it might do things like steam up or get affected by rain and this kind of stuff, um, so which would affect your use as well of a firearm, and it may get, inv may get interfere with aiming as well. Um, so for numerous reasons, the important part to take away from here is even in the modern military and policing world, helmets that protect the top of the head primarily and leave the face open are still normal. So just to finish off, I just want to consider 
Why, therefore, do some people wear full face protection? Well, the obvious simple answer is because it offers more protection, okay? But what are the exact reasons that um, outbalance or outweigh those other reasons for having an open face helmet that we spoke about? So clearly, this has got the advantage of sight, breathing, communications, eating and drinking, uh, possibly materials and costs as well. Um, so I just wrote down a few thoughts, but I'd welcome your thoughts below here as well. Now, the first thing that came up in my mind when I thought about full face protection was the thing that I do twice a week is HEMA with a fencing mask on. And very clearly, full face protection is needed in a sporting context to protect your face. <laughs> so quite simply, when you're doing an activity where you just you don't want to get hurt and actually being able to communicate is not that important. Uh, peripheral vision is not that important. Um, eating and drinking, where you can take the fencing mask off. So within a fencing environment, and this would also apply to things like um, uh, Bohurt, um, you know, full full contact uh, armored fighting, stuff like this, or um, uh, kendo or anything like that. So full face protection in a sporting context, I think is obviously required to meet health and safety uh, reasons. However, I promise you that, that it would be much more pleasant for those of us who fence regularly if we didn't have to have a mesh over our faces. We'd be able to breathe more easily, wouldn't be so hot and sweaty, be much, much nicer. Uh, you know, but we don't have to communicate with superior officers or um, do law enforcement or anything like that. So we can wear full face protection, um, but it comes with drawbacks. Um, now, related to that also is tournament. I mentioned the boho thing. Well, clearly, if you're in tournament fighting, so if we look at medieval art, very often we see things like great, great bassinets or certain types of uh, great helm worn in a tournament setting that aren't particularly common or become less common in the later 15th century in a battlefield setting. So clearly, there are some people who might wear one of these in war for all of the advantages it offers, but then they might put on a great bassinet with a locking visor to fight in pole ax with pole axes in the lists. Now remember, again, communication not so important, uh, peripheral vision not so important, potentially even breathing not so important because you know if you get tired you can take a break and the fights are probably not going to be that long, you're not going to be marching around for ages, this kind of stuff. Um, the other thing I noticed about ha uh, face protection is that if we look at the art, you very often see the people on horseback wearing full face protection, but the people on foot with open face helmets. Uh, and this is anybody who's done reenactment or fought in medieval armour will recognise that if you're sitting on a horse, for a start you're not expending so much energy because the horse is wa walking or running, you're not walking or running. So yeah, obviously it takes a bit of energy to ride a horse and you're being jiggled around. But basically, you're not going to get very out of breath riding a horse, whereas someone who's running around on foot, swinging a pole axe around, is more likely to get out of breath. So breathing is more important on foot, but also vision, I would argue, is more important on foot because you need to see where you're stepping, you need to make sure you're not about to fall over something, you need to see that person who's charging in from the side, this kind of stuff. So vision is far more important for foot combat, for infantry, I would say, than for cavalry. Um, remember the horse does the stepping and making sure you don't trip over for you. You don't do that when you're on a horse. Um, and um, <laughs> the other thing we should mention is um, missiles. Now, if you know specifically that you're being shot at, then indeed having a visor seems like a very, very good idea, doesn't it? But the simple fact is that if you have a raisable visor, like salets often do, like bassinets do, like later great helms do, then what you can do is you can go into the missile fire, maybe with your pavis or with that one, uh, whichever you've got, um, and then when you get into close combat, you can put your visor up. And we actually see this in a lot of ma medieval art. We see people with the visors up or their helmets tilted back in close combat, but when they're going into the enemy or in a cavalry charge, they'll have the visors down because that's when all the arrows or crossbow bolts are coming their way. So it can be contextual based within a moment as well. You can have one down as you're going in and then up once you're in. So I hope this has been thought provoking. If you can think of other reasons why you might want to have face protection or not have face protection. But I think the basic takeaway from this is number one, historically, huge numbers, the majority of people throughout history 
have elected to have helmets which have some part of their face open or exposed, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is the modern military and police also predominantly choose helmets that leave some part of their face or all of their face open and exposed. You now know the reasons, we've talked about those. And so next time we're looking at a fantasy situation like whether it's Batman or, or Judge Dredd or whatever, now think about, rather than just criticizing their armor because it's got an exposed face, think, well, is that any different to a 15th century man-at-arms with a salad with an exposed lower face? Is it any different to a Roman soldier in Lorica Segmentata with an open face? Or a hoplite with a linothorax and an open face? You know, so historically and in the modern world, whether it's bullets, bows, spears, swords, pole axes, whatever, the majority of people throughout history have elected to fight with an exposed and open face. I hope this has been useful. Thanks for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe and I'll see you back here again soon. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.